Hello and welcome to Nerd Punches Nerd, the only podcast where a bunch of nerds pretend to physically fight over minor pop cultural minutia. Today, we're going to be trying out something a little bit different. It's our special book club edition, where a few of us, in this case, just me, Jeremy, and Sam, will be reading through something. Now, this time it was actually something that Sam came up with, uh, an idea, if you will, from his own head. So, take it away, Sam. All right, so basically what happened was I recently found out that there was a movement among fans of the Song of Ice and Fire books. Those would be um, the books that Game of Thrones, the TV show, is based on, for people who don't know that, um, should know that. Um, so there are these books called, uh, you know, the, the whole thing is called The Song of Ice and Fire. And the fourth book and the fifth book, which were written separately, um, take place chronologically over the same period of time. Um, but the fourth book only has half the characters, and then the fifth book has the other half of the characters. So everything is, is sort of split up. Um, and there's a movement, I just found out about this recently, although it's, it's been around for, for several years already. Um, several fans have tried to combine the fourth and the fifth books together to tell um, the full story with all of the characters in, uh, in a more chronological order, rather than um, just following certain characters and then following other characters. So I found out about this, and I said, what if we, Jeremy and I, reread these books following that chronological order instead of just reading book four and then reading book five. Now, Jeremy actually has been rereading Song of Ice and Fire for a few months now um, to catch up. He actually read the first three books and he is, was just about to start the fourth one. So the timing was very good. Um, and so we said, all right, let's do this and we're going to put it on the podcast. So we decided to follow an order that was come up by um, this guy named uh, Sean Collins. Is that his name? Yeah, Sean T. Collins. Sean T. Collins, who wrote, um, he writes a, a Song of Western Fire blog. Uh, it's called All Leather Must Be Boiled, I think. That's the name of it, right? Yeah, he's kind of a super nerd for yeah. Song of Ice Much Fire. nerdier than us. <laughs> I mean, he, he has a Tumblr and he answers questions. He write, he blogs about the show for the Rolling Stones website. Right. So he came up with this, um, you know, this arrangement. Apparently there's a few different versions of how to combine the chapters of the two books. And he put one together that he uh, he made a pretty decent argument for why he thinks that this is the best one. So what we're doing is we're reading the official Sean T. Collins approved all leather must be boiled reordering of A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons um, into one combined super novel, which is twice as long as a normal book, or actually three or four times as long as a normal book because, well, yeah. you know, <laughs> the books are already pretty long. I mean, it's something like 1,800 pages when you combine yeah. the two books together. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about the first four chapters, which go something like this. It's the prologue of each of the books, but in the opposite order, meaning you have Dance of Dragons first, and then after that you have Feast of Crows, and then after that, the first two chapters in A Feast for Crows. And we'll get into the specifics of that in a second. But of course, right, we should I preface think... by saying, of course, that there will be spoilers for everything in the series. Actually, I was going to ask you about that. Because obviously there are spoilers for everything that's happened in the first three books. But yes. should we hold off on spoilers for events that are going to happen later in the fourth and fifth books? Okay, so if you want to do that, we can sort of also divide things up and sort of say, after a certain point, maybe this will be our spoiler section, and only try to talk about it from a perspective of, as though this was the first time. It's going to be hard to do it that way, but I think we could try. Well, I mean, we can certainly talk about the books knowing that we've read them already, but just trying to avoid any kind of spoilers for future events. Yeah, okay, if, I guess we can possible. And yeah, and I think that's a good idea to split the podcast and, and you know, demarcate where, you know, the point at which we will actually start spoiling everything and that, you know, people who haven't actually read A Feast for Crows or Dance of the Dragons should definitely stop listening at that point. Right, so if there's anyone who's only just started reading or hasn't started and wants to just sort of follow along, then it's the first four in this chapter order. And I'll include a link in the description of the video as well. So the podcast will have 
a link to the specific order, which makes it pretty easy. You just sort of read one chapter from one book and then maybe a few more from another one. Usually there's not that much switching back and forth from what I can tell. So, so let's get started. All right. So the first chapter in this order is the original prologue from A Dance with Dragons, which is actually the fifth book. Um, it is called Six Skins. Yeah. Is that the name of it? That's right. That's what I wrote down. Um, Six Skins, referring, of course, to Varamir Six Skins. Um, and it is told from his perspective, the first time we ever see his, his uh, point of view in any of the books. Um, explaining the aftermath of what happened after, after the battle at the wall, after the, the wildling forces were scattered and, you know, Stannis came and killed everyone. Um, but it's interesting. It was interesting to me, not just because it talks about the aftermath of what happened after that battle, but because it also tells us a little bit about who Varamir was before Mance Raider ever came along. You know, before he joined up and and went to wage war on the on the Night's Watch, um, we find out a little bit about who this guy is, Varamir. We learn that Varamir is a made up name. Um, you know, he he basically picked it because he thought it sounded cool. Yeah. Right. Which which kind of makes sense because like, who is named Varamir? That's just not, you know, it's not a name that people. I believe his name his name was originally. Um, uh, well, Lump or Bump? Yeah. I get them mixed up. No, Bump was his... Bump was his brother, brother. right? <laughs> Which is a great... His name was Lump and he had I a brother don't know. It's, Bump. It's, it's a great sort of set of names in that... That also seems a little yeah. unlikely, granted, but I think... I, I almost feel like those were sort of like nicknames, like not the real names. I don't even know if they ever had a name. It was more the point that the parents weren't really clever enough to think about it i'm sure i'm sure that he if he had grown to adulthood and not become a you know a skin changer and you know uh, this villainous character then he probably would have just picked another name anyway you never uh, know i mean what about but hot pie? Not as cool a name as varamir don't forget right hot hot pie yeah that's true <laughs> but is hot pie going to be known as hot pie forever who knows? I mean, it's can, just can you imagine things. being like forty years old and and just saying, "Hi, my name's Hot Pie." I know it is weird. And I bake I mean, you some bread. There are weird names. A lot of people have nicknames because remember, that's one of those sort of important things about the world is that some people have one name, some people have two names, which is actually something that comes up here, where they talk about the differences between names. Oh yes. That's that's actually coming up in the next chapter. But names are also important here, which is why it's an interesting parallel to the next part too, which we haven't gotten to yet. But that's just also an interesting reason why the two prologues have an interesting parallel in terms of what they're talking about. They do. He um, becomes more powerful in a sense. He changes based on his name. He calls himself Faramir, but he also calls himself Six Skins. To indicate that he can essentially control six creatures at once. Right. Not necessarily simultaneously, but he thralls them. But right, he holds them in his thrall. Or, yeah. uh, Including uh, some very dangerous things, like a bear and a so-called shadow cat, which is probably some sort of panther. Right. I mean, you know, George R. R. Martin likes to come up with all these great names for things that are, you know, turns out, oh... It's just a panther. And panthers are pretty cool. They are, but it's just like... I don't know they're that they're native to, you know, cold climates, though. Well, it's an interesting question. They're not. I think they're native to hot climates. Now, there are there are large cats that live in cold areas, you know, like snow leopards and stuff, but they're uh, not... I, I get the impression that shadow cats have, have, like, dark fur. I assume that's why they're called shadow cats. Well, they and also have... Uh, I imagine that they don't... They're not actually... You you know, normally anything with dark fur would not be native to a, a cold, snowy area. Well, according to the internet, shadow cats have thick black fur with white stripes. With white stripes? Yeah. Okay. Like zebras? I guess, yeah. Zebras so, also not, not native to cold areas. Although it makes a little bit more sense from a sort of camouflage perspective, too. 
But yeah, the other thing was depending on the environment. Yeah, was something called the, the remember the lizard lion? Yes, which is essentially just an alligator. An alligator, head. right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> just, they're just called lizard lions. So you never. It's not necessarily that amazing at this point. They're not not a unicorn quite yet. If you okay, that's true. So anyway, getting back to the prologue. So Varamir. So this is what I thought was interesting about Varamir. Um, Varamir is almost, you know, back back in the days, in the old days, um, first of all, he apparently killed his brother. It's a little unclear. But he right. might have, um, you know, possessed one of the family dogs and in the form of the dog killed his brother. Yeah, it's um, quite clear. It's happened. not totally clear. His brother definitely was killed by something. Um, but... Yeah, it it seems that he did it. We don't know why. His brother, he was his younger brother, right? He was like six, and his brother was like two or something like that. I right? don't remember the numbers, but that's not, but that is right. He's the older. Yeah. Um, we also find out that he basically became this like fairy tale monster. He was like living. He lived in this cave, and the villages all had to like pay tribute to him. And he would force them, he would like hunt women and, and force the women to come to his cave and he would have sex with them. And, and like heroes would try to slay him. Like he was basically a monster. Yeah, he was sort of like a, a one of those evil sorcerers. Right, right. But, you know, it's it's like something out of a story, except that it's presented in, in like a much more, in, in a very sort of straightforward way, which I thought was cool. You know, it's sort of like getting the perspective of like, you know, the evil ogre from the fairy tale who just thinks of himself as just a regular guy who happens to be an ogre who, you know, was like the king of a, of, of this, his little domain. Um, and he kind of, he misses that life because he went and joined Mance Raider and that was a mistake because it was his, uh, his destruction and downfall. Well, I also think it's interesting is this talk about abominations and the weird parallels between him and Bran because mm -hmm. Bran also seems to have some sort of gift and it's not really clear exactly how strong he is. Obviously he was able to take over Hodor but we don't really know how that was. We don't really know if it was the same way as this particular instance because it might have been that Hoarder just sort of fell. He he just, you know, passed out when it happened. At, you know, or, you know, maybe it just seemed like, well, whatever. You know, because Hoarder is more simple, so it's a little bit different from from this case. Yeah, now it's interesting. We talked about this a little bit on one of our other podcasts, on the Song of Ice and Fire podcast, um, the, the Game of Thrones podcast, I mean. Because on the TV show, Bran possesses Hodor in public in front of, you know, like the, the reeds and everyone, they see him. And Jojen is like, oh, that means you're like extra special because you can possess a human. And there's no mention at all of this concept of abomination or, or that this is a terrible thing. It's just, you know, but in addition to, as I mentioned, you know, there's no question at all about the, the morality of it. Um, it's just right. sort of accepted like, wow, Although, that's really cool. I think in this case, if it did, I feel like in a weird way, the Jojen might say it was okay as sort of a an extension as something necessary but it's hard to say it's a different sort of thing though but from what i recall of the books um jojen never actually finds out that bran possessed hodor right yeah, at any I think time that's right. i don't think he ever finds out and and bran clearly feels a little guilty about it and thinks that it's he thinks that it's something that he needs to keep a secret from everyone Right, he like instinctively knows that there's something wrong with it, which is confirmed in this chapter when Varamir says that his teacher, um, whose name I forget, Hagon, but he was Hagon, right? So he was actually taught shape shifting. He he had the talent for it. Um, he was able to do it, but he was sort of uh, trained um, to to reach his potential by this other shape shifter. His name was uh, Skin Changer. I mean, his name was Hagon, who told him. You know, you can't ever possess a person. It's an abomination. Um, you can't possess an animal when it's having sex because that's an abomination. Of course, he did that too. Um, 
And you were, were there other things that that you're not allowed to do? That's an abomination. Wait, so he can't he can't eat human flesh. Right. He can't have sex with another animal as an animal. Right. Was there something else? Uh, maybe that's it. I'm not really sure. It's and the the parallel to Bran is I mean it's clear not just the fact that he's a skin changer and he's you know very powerful and all of that but this chapter actually there's a subtle reference to Bran and Jojen and Mira in oh. this chapter yeah when um when Varamir is dying and his spirit like temporarily goes into the he's, well, hold on, he's near hold on. A, yeah just just think about it this way don't. We're not trying to spoil later on, though. No, I'm saying we can we can spoil stuff that happens in this chapter because we're talking about this chapter. I'm saying I don't want to spoil things that happen later. Right, okay, go on. But I'm saying in this chapter, when Varamir is dying, his spirit, like, goes... He's he's standing near a, um, a weirwood tree. Yes. And his spirit goes into the weirwood tree temporarily, and he has this vision, and he sees all this stuff. And one of the things that he sees or hears is... Um, an elk with three children riding on it. Oh yeah, you're right. Which that's clearly a reference to to Bran and Jojen and Mira. Right. Although we obviously we didn't see that in the show. At this point, at the end of book three. At the end of book three, we know that there's that they they meet up with um cold hands with cold hands, and then he rides an elk. Right. That's right. Do do we know that he rides an elk? Yes. I think we, we, do. Do. we do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I actually have not reread the first three books, so my memory of that is a little, a little uh, shakier than Jeremy's. Yeah, I um, mean, it's interesting that they didn't have that part in the show where they have the gate where Sam has to say the secret words, in a matter of speaking, of the Night's Watch. I don't really feel like it's that secret, but maybe the secret is you had to know what to say. Maybe they thought it was too magical. I don't know. I'm well. Sure. I think what they're doing is they're stretching out Bran's story a little bit. So one of the ways they can stretch it out is by having him meet with Sam and have Sam help him cross the wall before he meets with Cold Hands, and then have him meet with Cold Hands afterwards. But you Cold know, Hands and then it can't. sort of it sort of um, extends the story a little bit. Yeah, but Cold Hands can't get past the gate. That's the right. whole point. Right. Right. But in the book, that's that's the last chapter. Um, in a storm of swords that has brand is the chapter where he meets Sam, goes through the gate and meets cold hands. Hmm. And then that's um, it. You know more Brent, right? Yeah, I guess we'll have to see because I don't know how. So I think I think probably in the next season of the show, Brand will meet up with cold hands. Um, you know, Sam is long gone by that point, but they just they just sort of uh, you know they change the order of the events a little bit so that so that Brand has a little bit more to his story. And it doesn't seem like there's just... No, I mean, it's it's already bad enough that it seems like nothing is happening in his story. Um, anyway, that's all I had to say about the first chapter. So, um, did you have any more thoughts? Well, of course, it is interesting that he accidentally turns the woman into, you know, a walk, the one of the others. One of the, um, like, one of the walkers. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say he accidentally turns her into one of the walkers. He basically just prevents her from being able to escape from them, but she probably wouldn't have escaped from them anyway. Right, right, that's true. They were all around. I doubt I doubt that she would have been able to escape from them. Um, the what's question. interesting is that in the end, when he, as the wolf, yes. at the very end, he sees her and he, he thinks that she's looking at him and like she recognizes him, um, which uh -huh. is, I mean, is maybe that's just in his own mind or maybe she really does recognize him. We don't know. But uh, it's just, it's a little bit haunting. Well, the real question is, is he dead? Because there's often this thing in the different prologues where somebody dies. Right. The, and usually it's the point of view character, right? I mean, that's how it was. That is how it was in the first um, three, right? Basically, every point of view character in a prologue dies, I want to say. Right? The, like, who was the prologue person in The Storm of Swords? Uh, oh man, who? That's a good question. Oh, I remember. It's Chet. It's Chet who does it. Yeah. And he gets killed by the others. Yep. yep. 
That's right. So he he doesn't quite die in the chapter, but he dies after. But he is. Well, I mean, he does die because he becomes he becomes a, a a zombie, right? Yeah. Well, we only find that out later. Oh, but he, you're saying he doesn't actually die in the chapter. That's right. Right. Okay. All right. So that's one. But mostly people do die in the prologue chapters. Yeah. Um, Crescent. In this case, with Varamir, it's sort of a, a weird example because he he dies, but he gets his second life. True, um, but the question which is something is, that he that he explained that uh, that well, yes. skin changers can have this thing called second life, which means they uh, basically go their spirit goes to one of their animals, and then they gradually sort of forget about being human and and just like basically become an animal over time. Right, and that could say something interesting about future stuff as well, although we're not getting to that yet. Um, it could. It could. We'll have to see. Maybe. It's hard to say. But, so let's move on to the next one. Alright. The prologue of Feast for Crows. Prologue of a Feast for Crows. So this one is called Old Town. And, uh, and the, there's a lot of parallels here. One of them has to do with, you know, teachers and people, you know, not really following the lessons they should be. There are things about names. Right. Yeah, the thing about names, just to explain, um, the, the point of view character is this guy named Pate, who's this... We don't really know who he is. All we know is that he's common-born. Um, kind and of he's, a, he's He's a student at the Citadel. He's trying to learn to be a maester, but he's kind of incompetent, and it's not likely that he's ever going to become a maester. Um, but the important thing to know about him is that he, he's common born, he's poor, he only has one name, and that's brought up as an issue because there's another character, um, Leo Tyrell, I believe his name is, right? Yes. Leo Tyrell, and there's, there's some, something is made of the fact that Leo Tyrell has two names, and therefore that, that makes him somebody, and paid as a nobody, and they're not on equal footing. Um, especially when it comes to, you know, being insulted and taking offense to an insult or seeking to redress your insult, you know, if he was, if he was actually somebody important, then he could, he could fight back, but he really can't. Um, so there's, there's a little parallel there with names and, and the importance of names, having one name or having two names. Um, but there's also some weirdness here too. Yeah. I mean, we see a lot of this oddness. The Sphinx is kind of an odd guy, and right. there's a reference to this guy named Merwin the Mage, right? And these things called glass candles, right? Which you know are basically pieces of glass that are shaped to look like candles, but are not. They're not so, actually glass, though, right? Aren't they? They're made of obsidian. Well, some are, but the point is the same: is that you can't actually light them because there's nothing to light. Yeah, I thought it was funny that um um. They explained that these there are these glass candles, and the last challenge before you can become a maester is you have to spend a night um, trying to use whatever arts you've learned to light them, and nobody can do it. Right. And so it's the students the talk about how secret. Right? The students talk about how like this is supposed to be like a lesson in humility, um, you know, because there are things that you can't achieve even though you're you've got all this education and and whatever, um, but really we as readers are privileged to know that like the reality is that that's not really true like these these candles are supposed to be lit and there's something magical about them and and there's supposed to be some sort of meaning to the fact that now they have just you know there's this rumor that the candles are lit now they they became lit at some point recently probably uh, nobody nobody like, knows why right well dragons we presume know. that it relates yeah. to the dragons Right? They don't they don't really know about the dragons. They might have heard some rumors about dragons, but they well, don't they, Yeah, they, they talk actually about do it. talk about it. Yeah. They talk about the rumors of dragons. Uh some of them don't really believe it because it's it's all just rumors at this point. Yes, and yes. Uh, the rumors are and they're inconsistent. And that you know, the characters make the point of like, Oh, they said they were in this town, they were in that town, we don't know what's really going on. Um but but some of the characters do believe that, that the dragons have come back. 
they don't quite really connect it exactly with candles. I think one of the characters points out that the candles are made of dragon glass, and that's significant in some way. Yeah, because supposedly dragon glass has some kind of you know, mystical properties. Now, I will say, um, as a critique, I didn't really like this chapter very much. Okay, okay. I thought that there was a lot of exposition. Um, the problem is that we're being introduced to a whole new set of characters, as is often the case um, early on in, in one of the Song of Ice and Fire books, because often um, in any of the books, there will be a new character with, you know, in a new environment that we don't really know anyone or know anything about them. And so we have to kind of learn who they are. And because we're only going to be with these guys just for the prologue, and we're never going to come back to them, um, you know, I mean, that's it, whatever. <laughs> I don't consider that a spoiler. Um, that basically, like, these people don't really come back at all with the rest of the book. Um, you know, we have to learn a lot about them very quickly. So there's this, you know, the storytelling is a little clumsy. Pate as a character is not very interesting. He's the point of view. He's mainly obsessed with this, this girl who's like the daughter of she's the daughter of an innkeeper unclear or possibly the daughter of a prostitute I mean, it's a serving wench like is her mother right right oh her mother her mother is a serving wench she's basically selling her virginity yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's a little bit sick actually um, and you know pate's like romanticizing it right well pate's in love with her and he, he also wants says, to like run away with her you know he says later on, you know, go back and tell her that she belongs to you. You know, that whole thing. So it's not exactly like Pete is so, such a great person. You know, he has a lot of dark thoughts at times. And it's yeah. only, he's a thief. There's no question about it. And the yeah. real reason he steals is because he thinks if I don't get money soon, someone else is going to take Rosie instead of me. I thought it was interesting that we find out he was actually accused of thievery earlier when he yes. was actually innocent. But I was trying to figure out if the alchemist, um, you know, heard about this somehow and decided, oh, this guy was accused of stealing. You know, maybe he's a good prospect for getting, getting him to steal something from me. You know, like I, I just thought there was, it was a little bit too much to be a coincidence. The fact that he was accused of stealing before and now he's being made to steal something again. Well, at but this point, maybe there's nothing to that. We don't really know anything about the alchemist. Right. I mean, why is he called an alchemist? No, we know why he's called an alchemist. Why? Because he says that he can turn iron into gold. Well, so he says. No, but that, I mean, it's we know what he means. Oh, well, right. He means, like, get me the key and I'm going to give you a gold piece. <laughs> I'm going right. to give you a gold coin. Like, I'm like a, a play on words. Right? Yeah, it's it's a... Uh, Exactly. It's like well, it's, a like I, a plan. I think there I think you're right. I think part of the problem is that there's some interesting and important things going on in this chapter. Some sort of clues and pieces of information that George R. R. Martin is, is expressing. But that being said, it doesn't seem like Pate really matters. And the real problem is is that you know like, The only reason that Pate matters at all is because Pate is the personal assistant of one of the archmaesters of of the citadel and what he steals is this key which is like a skeleton key that can open any door in the citadel true yeah. and so basically pate um you know so his only importance to the story is as someone who has access to this key and can get it to this character, the alchemist, who wants it for some reason. We have no idea why he wants it. Um, but that's the only reason that, that paid is at all important to the story. Yeah, I mean, we don't really know. At least at this point. We don't really have any idea about what's going on. And then, at the end of this chapter, Pate gets killed. So, he clearly is not important at all. <laughs> Yeah, so it is, the problem is is that, uh, okay, so this is where we sort of quasi-talk about spoilers, in that in the last few books, so what happens? In the first book, you have a prologue 
the person who dies is directly related to what happens next because they find this guy running away and it's sort of the impetus for you know discovering about in game of thrones Zonic. right yes yeah. and that kind of kicks off the story yeah in, in the second one it's our old buddy stannis you know who right. who we will see a lot more of in that book so it's re well i mean so it's it not makes Sense. It's not Stannis's perspective, but it's the perspective of somebody in Stannis's court. No, but it tells us a but lot yeah, it about introduces Stannis. us to Stannis and to his court. Right, and in this now in the third one, I wasn't an enormous fan of that prologue, to be honest, because it didn't really tell me that much. Other than there were a lot of guys who didn't like Mormons and were getting sick of it. Actually, if we're going to talk about prologues, we didn't like. My least favorite prologue, um, aside from the Old Town the prologue of Book Four, is the prologue of Book Two. But the reason I didn't like that one is because it has like a very sort of magical um, sword and sorcery kind of feel to it that I think is not consistent with the tone of the rest of the book. And so I think it gives like a misleading impression of, of what kind of book it is. Maybe, but I still kind of liked it. I thought it was, I thought it was good at talking about things and introducing us to Stannis, and also to Melisandre. And Davos. All right, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time. All right. Well, I guess just in terms about of thinking about the prologues the of other books. All right. Well, but it's really just sort of thinking about what's the purpose of this prologue. What is it trying right. to do? Right. What's the point? So this one. This one introduces us to Old Town. We've never been to Old Town before. That's true. And you have to imagine it's going to be important. Um, we would presume that it is important. I mean, the maesters are obviously relevant. They have a lot of power. We know that. It's, it's just, it's, a, it's an aspect of the culture of Westeros that we know very little about what's really going on behind the maesters. And, um, and it might be something that, that would be good to know. For us as readers, and also, you know, it's it's something that I think most of the characters in the book spend very little time thinking about. You know, what goes on in Old Town with the with the Citadel and the Maesters. People people really don't think about that at all. They think of the the Maesters as basically non entities. They're servants. You know, they serve the realm, um, and people don't don't think of them as as really you know anything really important going on there, except like they mark the change of the seasons and you know things like that. So do you think that there's a connection to the spotted pate, the pig boy story, the good-hearted lout whose stupidity turned out to have something that was actually a strength after all? No. I don't think that, that there's a direct parallel. I don't think that this character has some hidden strength or that he's going to, you know, get the you know, take get get the advantage over over somebody else who is ostensibly higher than him in society. I think he just has a common name which is embarrassing because it's like a silly name. Mm. Uh in one of the mm -hmm. one of one of the Duncan Egg stories, they make a point about how there's like three different guys who are all named Watt and they have to come up with, you know, distinguishing characteristics to tell them apart because otherwise they would all be named Watt. And it's just like a just a little joke of George R. R. Martin's. Well, he, like this is a common name and it's a stupid name, and you know, well, people. He's, he's uh, on that other time. Yeah. I mean, think of Walder and Walda. Right. There's Fair yes. Walda. There's yes. Fat Walda. Right. <laughs> Black right, Walder. Right. And there's Black Walder and big and little and small and fat and. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And of course, don't forget, Hodor is technically named Walder. That's true. Is he Walder Frey's true. son? Many people don't know that. Yeah, it, he, it was actually revealed in like the first book, but they didn't bring it up in but, the show. But they never bring it up, and, and most people probably don't don't remember. Um, but yes, his real name is Walder. It's possible that he's a descendant of Walder Frey, although how he would have ended up in Winterfell, I have no idea. Unless, maybe he came along with Catelyn. Possible. I, I mean, Nan is the one... Who's his mother or grandmother? Who is? Nan. Old Nan. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he probably has nothing to do with Walder Frey. Yeah, it's probably just a coincidence. Probably a coincidence. Okay. 
So do you have anything else about the prologue? Um, uh, no, let's move on to the next chapter. All right, so this next chapter is the prophet. Right. And it's one of those interesting ones that he starts doing, especially in this book, where instead of using the name of someone, he describes them. And it's not the only time he does that. And he goes back and forth all the time by which he he, George R. he never really does that in the first three books at all, right? Except yeah, possibly for the um the prologues or epilogues. Right, but he doesn't say people's names. He just says prologue or epilogue. Right, right. But in the in these books, the fourth book and the fifth book, he started having all of these chapters that were more descriptive, right? Describing right. somebody's characteristic or some aspect of them rather than just saying their name. Right. So this one's called the Prophet. And it's about Aaron Greyjoy, who is Balon's brother, and also, and therefore Theon's uncle. But he's like a priest, a priest of the drowned god. Yes. And there is something that came up in this chapter that I'd forgotten about, which is that similar to uh, the red gods and the red priests, they also have their own dichotomy of gods the storm god versus the drowned god where the drowned god is the one that's supposedly good yes at least from their perspective and the storm one is not i had forgotten about that yes i noticed that too and it was striking to me because aaron to me it seemed like very simplistic in Definitely. the sense that like anything that good happens is the drowned god and anything bad is the storm god and yes. you know when he finds out that uh, Balon died. The first thing he says is, "The storm god killed him, and now he's oh, yeah. with the drowned god." Yeah, like, exactly. You know, it's <laughs> with mermaids. You remember yes. that? He's yes, the mermaids. They're serving him seventy virgin mermaids. Yeah, well, I don't know how well that's going to work, but I guess you know, <laughs> maybe he's a mer person now, or maybe he can like shift. I don't know how it would work. I I don't know. He's feasting in the watery halls. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting in that it seems it's a very old school kind of religion the worship of the ocean in a lot of ways sort of like the whole poseidon thing the way people would worship poseidon yeah. and the who were just sailors yeah except that poseidon was also the god of storms yeah that's so, why it was sort of interesting because there was a clear connection there yeah. whereas in this case it's exactly like what you're saying where there was a specific you know the ocean is the good thing the storm is a bad thing and there's nothing else. Yeah. That's all there is, just the ocean and the storm. Or as if you're only thinking about things in an ocean perspective, that kind of, you know, you can understand that in a lot of you know, I guess because yeah. you know, if your lives are on the ocean all the time, well those are gonna be the big things. So so a number of things struck me about this chapter. One of them is is talking about the ironborn religion. It's interesting to me that like a key element of their religion involves drowning people and then resuscitating them with CPR. Yes. Um, that, to me, seems very cultish. And I think that Mar that's actually what Martin is going for, because, like, the people who, who are devoted to the drowned god are, like, really devoted to him, especially Aaron. We know that Aaron um, was, like, kind of a wild, you know, partier. He wasn't very serious. Theon, Theon li remembers liking him a lot, right? Right. Um, you know, and that he was really fun. And then at some point he his he was in some wreck or something like that and he drowned. Yes. And you know, and almost died, but then he came back and he was changed and he was devoted to the drowned god and now he's this dour priest. Um and and it's interesting to me how, how he's also obsessed with in, indoctrinating others, you know, into this, this drowned status where they're you know, the drowned men um, you yeah, know, and, have to, they have to submit to being drowned and being revived. Because um, it is, it really is like a cult. Well, and it really is, I feel like they're, you know, people are, really are being indoctrinated into this religion. Yeah, I think that's a good point, especially if you think about what he says when he, when he compares his own priests to everyone else. He's like, oh, what they get is they just get a little bit of sprinkling of water right. on the that's forehead. Right. Yeah, when they're babies. babies. Whereas yeah. we actually... We actually essentially die. Drown to death. <laughs> Although he was saying that he's never had somebody actually completely die. Although it's happened in the past. Right. Which definitely would be a reason for people to sort of follow him. 
because he's very good at resuscitating. Yeah, well, I mean, it shows the uh, the depth of his faith, I guess. As well, especially considering it keeps happening. Right. I um I I kind of I, we've discussed this privately before, but I really kind of like the fact that um, the priests of the drowned god perform miracles in the, you know as far as they're concerned by reviving people through CPR. And so then CPR is is a miracle, He's and you know it's an magic act of God. It's magic, right? I always uh, like that definition of magic. That being something that cannot be explained right exactly and so like we as as you know modern readers we look at this and we laugh and we say ha 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 they're just doing cpr that's not magic but i think i think that george r R. martin is making a point which is that all of this magic stuff is you know it's not divine you know it's not coming from a god it's just some power that somebody has that they attribute to being from a god but is it really from a god? Well, you know, it could be, but there's really no way of knowing. There's no way of knowing. And well, we don't and know. I, like, I don't think, I personally, my interpretation of Martin's intent is that Martin does not intend that to, there to be any difference between what Aaron does in uh, resuscitating people from drowning and what the priests of the Red God do in reviving people from death. As far as I think. That it's Martin's intention that those acts are equivalent in terms of their, you know, status as being divine miracles. Mm -hmm. Other people might disagree with me. It's sort of an interesting thing because there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot to unpack. We really don't know why he hates Euron so much. He calls him a godless man. We mm -hmm. really don't know what that means. Well, he doesn't. At some point, he says that he he's like a creature of ego or something like that. Like he worships himself. True. It's and you know it's it's clear that Euron doesn't particularly care about the drowned god, right? He might pretend to for convenience, but he's not he's not devoted in the same way that Aaron is devoted. Um, we know that he hates Euron. Yes, but we don't really understand. There's something, there's something. There's a couple of references to a to a, a rusted hinge, right? He has these nightmares about like squeaky hinges and like somebody opening a door, and it's Euron that opens the door, and this is like part of his nightmare. We have no idea what that's about. Um, we could speculate. Yeah, we could. I mean, it could just be some sort of abuse in some way. I mean, right? That's, that's what it seems like. It's an obvious. That's what it seems like. That that Euron was was like abusing him when he was younger in some way, um, but it's it's so it's just sort of very subtle. Um, it never explained. All we know is that is that he 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 hates Euron, but he thinks that Euron is godless, and I think that those two things are are separate. His hatred for Euron and his determination that Euron is not an appropriate leader of, of the Ironborn because he's he's not a godly man are just clearly separate issues to me. Right. I don't I mean, think they're connected. I think there's also a few other things. I mean, there's the sexism that he has. Yes, he... Oh, I want to talk about that too. I want to talk about that too because he knows because we find out that he spoke to, to Balon shortly before Balon died about the succession. Yes. And Balon said... He wanted Asia to succeed him. Yeah. Right? Um, that would be Yara for people who watch the TV show. They oh, change from true, I suppose. Um, so he's, Balon says he wants Asia to succeed him. Basically, he says, like, whatever Theon has lost, we don't know what happened to him, but, you know, um, Asia should be the next, the next leader. Um, Aaron knows this, but he doesn't tell anyone because he's sexist. He is. That's that's basically the reason. He doesn't think that a woman can lead the Ironborn, so he goes against Balon's wishes, doesn't tell anyone, doesn't agree to support Aisha's claim, and basically settles on um, he wants Victarion to be the leader, Victarion being his other brother, um, who is both male and worships the drowned god, and therefore that makes him a, a good choice to be king of the Ironborn. Right, and of course he calls the king's moot, 
which yes. comes from an old word meaning, well, you know, meeting or gathering. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that the Ironborn, of all the people in Westeros, are the most democratic. Yeah, I know, it's kind of right? funny. Isn't it? It's, Isn't it it's, funny? Although, if you think about it, he was saying we haven't had a King's Moot in a long time. We haven't had one in, in a very long time. Like, no one really remembers when the last one was. Right, and so it, it's been it's not a, off the top of their head. As you said, you know, it's sort of saying, well, it's been basically just king to heir to king to heir for a while. We don't know how long. Right, but they have this old tradition of actually choosing their own leader. By which I think, some way. I think it actually might be consistent with with um, with Viking culture. I know that the Ironborn are supposed to be very much based on the Vikings. Um, and I seem to remember something about about Vikings actually like choosing their leader instead of just having someone be considered a noble and rule over them. I mean, they had both, but um, hmm. but but I seem to recall that. I I could be mistaken, but but I just think it's interesting that the Ironborn, who are like the most old school, you know, um, you we could even say like backwards or regressive culture in all of Westeros, but they they have this democracy that nobody else has. So I thought that was interesting. Um, something else that, that struck me about this chapter, this is a very minor point, but um, at some point, Aaron runs into a maester, uh, one of the maesters of one of the lords of the Ironborn, and this maester clearly has no idea where he is or who he's dealing with. Um, I mean, he's kind of, the only reason that he's even in there is to serve as sort of like a, a foil um, for the Ironborn culture to say like, oh, the line of succession and the, you know, the law of Westeros and blah, blah, blah. But like, who does he think he is? Oh, you oh. know what? This is an interesting Where point. does he think he is? Because this is actually a follow-up to the last chapter, the prologue. Yeah. The maesters being all over the place, they're even here. And considering that they're being listened to by this guy, this lord of the Iron Islands, maybe not, you know, Aaron, but somebody. Well, I mean, he's really not being listened to, but it, it does, well, it does actually, is. you're right, it does kind of draw attention to the fact that the maesters are everywhere and they're trying to influence things everywhere. Not, in this case, not very effectively. But, um, but yes, it, it, does, it does sort of echo... In the previous chapter, how we're learning about the maesters and like what's really going on with them, and we don't know. Um, that becomes, you know, it, it. So you're right; it does actually kind of highlight that a little bit. But in this case, this maester is way out of his depth, um, you know, and he's trying to tell Aaron how things should be run. And Aaron's Aaron's attitude is basically, "Who the fuck are you? Why are you talking to me? You should sit down and shut up." Yeah, and he gives him a stare, <laughs> which That's is some right. sort of like super powerful stare. Care Bear stare. Yeah, well, <laughs> he certainly thinks that there's some kind of power there. It's not really clear what kind of power, if any, he has, or if it's just that he's very charismatic. Oh no, I think it's I think it's just intimidation. I don't think I don't think it's supposed to be anything like magical. He's just uh, you know he's very imposing. All right, so that's also another interesting thing if you want to compare these two, you know, these few chapters together because you know, we start with something clearly supernatural, which is the skin changing, and then we move on to essentially discussions of things that are magical, you know, dragons and glass candles, right? you know, the Merwin the Mage guy, and now we're moving on to a guy who essentially thinks he's supernatural, but is he? And because it seems like from our perspective that he isn't, that kind of casts a shadow against everything else in that there could be some sort of other explanation for things. At least for... Well, I don't know that there could be any other explanation for, for Varamir and Warding. Like, we know Warding is real. True, we know it is real. So, but, but you're right, it does sort of, it provides an interesting contrast. But it could also be, but I think also part of why it's relevant is this maester thing. Because having him there, it does tell us this, that they're everywhere. Yeah. Even in the Iron Islands. And considering he's there, 
they must have been there for a long time, like a long time. So um, yeah, it actually it actually kind of raises the question of like how long have the Maesters been entrenched in every aspect of Westerosi society? Yeah, like when you know when the the Iron when the Ironborn ruled the Riverlands and King Harren the Black built Harrenhal, you know, which was not even that long. It's only about three hundred years ago. It was around the same time as Aegon's. Uh, Conquest. Well, right? actually, I, I remember that in the Old Town prologue, Pate is remembering how I think the inn has been around for like 600 years. Yeah. So it's certainly been there at least that long. Right. But I'm, I'm just wondering, like, did King Harren the Black have a maester in Harren Hall? Hmm. Presumably he did. I would have to assume so. But he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who would, who would keep maesters around. Well, you never really know with this stuff. I mean, it's funny because... Like, how know, far back does it go? Like, you know, King... Uh, who was the king that knelt? Was that Brandon in the north? Oh, yes. Brandon Stark? Yeah. Right. So, like, the, the king in the north who knelt to Aegon... Well, I, that wasn't actually so long ago either. That was, again, around the same time, about 300 years ago. But, like, going back further, like, the kings in the north, did they always have maesters? You know, hmm. I mean, the Night's Watch has been around forever. True. So I, I guess if the Night's Watch has been around for um, what eight eight thousand years or something, how long has the Night's Watch been around for? Ugh, it's not that a long. While. Well, let's see. We know that there was something with with Aegon. Like it, there is a one of the maesters was fed to Aegon. We know that much. Was fed to Aegon? Uh, a sorry, fed by Aegon to a dragon. Which Aegon? Which not Aegon the first? Aegon no, the, the second. He was yeah, no, it was the second. So Okay, I mean there's I feel like there's a lot of questions about these maesters. Like when um before the Targaryen conquest, when the Targaryens were living on Dragonstone, which Dragonstone is actually like one of the holdings of Valeria. It wasn't actually part of Westeros, right? Yeah, but that see that was um, only like a hundred and some years before, so Well it was after the Doom of Valeria, I guess, right? Yeah. But like did they have maesters? Did the Targaryens and Dragonstone have maesters? Oh, when the when the Rhoynish when the Rhoynish came into Dorne, you know, like did they have maesters? I feel like there's a lot of questions that we don't have the answers to. Where where did these guys come from? How long have they been doing this? And how did they become so deeply entrenched into, uh, you know, into every region and, and every family and every, every you know, um, noble, lordly family in all of Westeros? We don't know, but it's a fair, it's a fair thing to wonder. Hmm. You know what? I'm trying to remember. I think, I think Euron did something else. Oh no, not that was that was Shivakaran. So never mind. Oh, so we know that something like yeah, we'll we'll find. I I know what you're talking about. We'll talk about so that later. The 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 book starts 300 years after Aegon's Landing, right? Which is also the time of Heron the Black. But according right. to what we just found out in this in the prologue, theoretically, the, the old town's been around for 600 years, which is even right. longer. So that's than that. That's a long time. And we really don't know much about Westerosi history going back much before Aegon's conquest. That's true. Right? We know a little bit here and there. But we don't we don't really know a lot of detail. Most of what we know is about the Starks in the north. And even that are like mostly like old legends about, you know, the, the kings in the north, um, you know, and, and whatever, like, crazy stuff was going on up there. But we know very little about anything else that was going on anywhere in Westeros much before Aegon's conquest. We know that the Ironborn ruled the Riverlands, um, you know. <laughs> what yeah, else right. do we know, really? Uh, 
we know a little bit about the Rhinish coming into into Dorne. Well, there's at one point they do control some of Old Town a couple hundred years back. Who did? The Ironborn. The Ironborn. When they first come to power, because their Old Town is relatively it's not close, but it is on the on the ocean, so it's accessible. It, it's it's on a river, I think. Right. It's near Dorne. I'm not looking at a map right now. Is it actually on the ocean or is it on a river? I thought it was. Um, I thought it was. Almost certain. Not actually on the coast, but it was it was like accessible by river because it's no, you know... it's on the coast. Okay. It's near the south. It's supposedly like really, really old. One of the oldest cities built by the first men before it's, the Andal um, it's not, invasion. It's not technically in Dorne, right? It's technically in the Reach. Yes, and it's called Old Town because it's one of the oldest cities in Westeros. Right. And I think there's really no one, we have no idea how long the Citadel has been there. We know Old Town has been there for thousands of years. But what we don't know is how long the Citadel has been there. How long the Maesters have been doing stuff. I mean, obviously there's some kind of science stuff that they're doing. And maybe they did magic stuff back in the day too. I mean, obviously, with we, well, even with what we learned from Kyburn in book three right. is that he studied things that weren't supposed to be studied essentially. You right. Know, he looked into like, he basically killed people or at least cut open live people to check into their bodies. He actually says that in the show also, you know, to yeah, I, I think dead, it's, I opened they're, live they're explicit. They're explicit that one of the things he did is he did autopsies on people who were not actually dead. Right. Which isn't really autopsy. You could call it an, <laughs> an, um, an unwarranted surgery, if you will. Or um, um, dissections, I guess, would be <laughs> the correct term. Right, not an autopsy, but a dissection. He would dissect people who were actually still alive. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's right. So, it's interesting just from that perspective, because we really don't know. And it's one of those powers that's there, but we don't really know what kind of influence they have. I mean, we know so much about all the ones that have armies, you know. Obviously, there there is religious stuff all over the place, just with the different religious orders. Mm -hmm. But we don't really know much about the Mesas, other than they seem to theoretically be neutral. Right. That and that's all we know idea. about them is that they're they're supposed to be neutral. They're just supposed to sor serve the lords, like Pycelle served Ares, and before and whoever was before Ares. Yeah. yeah. They they're, they're there to serve. Robbers, you know, they're there. They know a lot about medicine and history right and you know like you said science to the extent that that the westeros do have any science um you yeah. know i guess you would call it like natural philosophy right okay okay that term makes sense um you know astronomy whatever whatever disciplines of study exist in westeros they they are the ones who, who kind of are the scholars, yes, yes, and yes. teachers, scholars and teachers and and healers. Well, right. For example, if you remember, um, Master Lewin, Master, he he was someone who basically said about the comet that it was like a rock. He gave a very scientific explanation for it. He said it was just a fiery right. rock from the right. heavens. Right. You know, it was very kind of clinical because part of that of course with him he was an interesting character in that he was someone who studied magic but never found any proof of it he studied it academically yeah well no he actually he was one of these things like he actually was interested but he said i think he said that he tried to do it yeah but he, he couldn't, couldn't make it work he could not figure it out like he um learned I, actually i think he says i think he said something like everyone who studies magic tries to make it work <laughs> exactly but no one can actually do it yeah, maybe he just needed to meet Merwin the Mage, if you know Merwin the Mage actually can do anything. Or uh, we, which no, I'm sure know. I'm sure that he knew Merwin the Mage. So it's an interesting question. Maybe it just wasn't the right. Opportunity. I mean, Lewin's not that old, right? No, I mean, I think that they would. He's have been supposed to be relatively young for a Maester. Mm, or so. I mean, he's been there for all of the Stark kids, anyway. Right, but I'm sure I'm sure that Marwyn was a prominent figure in the Citadel back when Lewin was studying there. Because Lewin's not that old. So anything else for the chapter three? No, 
No, I think we should move on to the next chapter. All right, so our final chapter here is called The Captain of the Guards. And it's our first real introduction to the magical world of Dorne. And it's funny <laughs> because uh, we do get a few things in book three, which we haven't gotten on the TV show yet. Although they play around with the chronology a little bit because the some of the Dornish people are already there at this point in the show. Or at least they would have been if they were following the chronology exactly. But obviously they're just delaying that, which, you know, reasonable enough. But they also don't have the Mace Tyrell, which they are also casting for next season. So it those are two people, those are two families that do not like each other for a lot of reasons. But right. so it's interesting. OK, so at this point, we're getting a lot of information as well. It's another massive information dump in a lot of ways. Now, it's interesting in that three out of four of these chapters are essentially info dumps. Some of them are characters that are going to be more relevant than others. And they're all telling us about things we don't really know much about already. So I guess the question is, how well does this chapter work at that point? I thought it was not too bad in terms of the exposition. It managed to sort of tell the story of what was going on through the characters' interactions with each other, rather than just monologuing. You know, I mean, I mean, Ario Hota monologues a little bit about his own background, but that's not really the point. You know, it, it, the, this chapter is not here to tell us how Ario Hota came to be the captain of the guard for the, you know, for Doran Martell. Like, that's not, you know, it's a, it's a very small part of the chapter. Um, the important things that happen happen between, not, not between um, Ario Hota or, or however you pronounce his name. Um, not between him and anybody, you know, he just kind of stands there quietly because he's a guard, but between Doran Martell and various other characters. Um, and, it, and it sort of tells us what's going on in Doran, which we don't really know anything about Doran at this point. Um, yes. But, but it, I think he does a good job of, of conveying what's going on there without just like dumping it. I, um, one thing I noticed in in this chapter is that the theme of this chapter basically is the contrast between people who, who want to like have like big dramatic actions and like take charge and go running off and do something bold and people who like, like wait and think and plan ahead. Um, you know, and the waiters and thinkers are, are Doran Martel and I would say Ario Hota himself, um, you know, because he's like a very quiet person hmm. and then he's kind of reserved he's and he sort of thinks about, you know, there's this point where he thinks about like, Sir Aris Oakhart and like, you know, what would happen if they were in a fight, you know, and he, he thinks, thinks he'd, he'd probably win, but he's you older. Know, yeah. He's you know, he has white hair, he's older. But it's but but clearly Ario Hotza is not is not a guy who likes to, you know, go and make big bold gestures, right? And neither neither is Doran Martell. But the other characters in this chapter definitely are are the, mm-hmm. the Sand Snakes, as they're known. Um the, the hot Martell's blood, children. Yeah. Right. That they call themselves, and it's really interesting yes. because yes, the the hot blooded, you know, Doran, you know, who, the Prince of Doran of Dorne, which is, I don't know, it's one of those sort of really names. <laughs> I mean, what? come on, that his name that is his Doran. name is Doran, yeah, and he's the Prince I mean, of Doran. I know. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, there a lot of these families have they maybe do it's, things maybe it's actually pronounced. Doran. Yeah, you didn't well, think of that, did you? I don't. Doran. Think I, well, we do know that a lot of that many families use Doran patterns Doran. in their names. You know, the Targaryens definitely do for sure, and they all sort of. Right. It, you know, and I think it's interesting from that perspective. But I guess it's sort of like Barry Baratheon. You know, it's like right. come on. Or Lanos Lannister. That's what it's like. Lanos Lannister. Prince Lanos. I mean... Um, well, not exactly. Because it's not like his first name is like his last name. It's It would be more like... If, I guess so. um, It's like... The if, name it would be like if, if, if one of the... Um, if one of the Tully's first name was River. Like River Tully of River Run <laughs> right. in the Riverlands, right? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that does sound stupid. Oh. And if he was a bastard, then his name would be River Rivers. <laughs> well, we'll get to Rivers later on. But the <laughs> in this case, we do have a few bastards. But you know, these are interesting because they all... It, it's one of those things that... It's interesting. I've always thought of bastard as being a term that refers exclusively to males. Is there like a, a female version of the word bastard? Hmm, I, mean, I mean, other than saying like bastard daughter, like... I don't think so. I think... No, I don't think so. Because we do have several of those in this chapter. I mean, no, I, I don't think so. Female think... bastard children. I think that just it it just tended to be like that because people didn't care about the girls. Well, yes. It the definitely women. tends to be used for men now. This is a derogatory word. Right. You lucky bastard. Right. Like for Monty Python. But no, I mean I think I mean, you know, if you're looking back in the day Probably nobody ever referred to a woman as a bastard because, like, that would just be so rude that, I mean, like, you wouldn't call anyone a bastard. But if you're well, calling call, somebody a bastard, uh, it well, would see, be, in, like, very rough company, and you'd only do it around people who are, they don't, like, they rough don't character. Say that, right? They, what do they say? They say natural-born daughter. Right. That's how they, well, they say natural daughter. Not natural right. born. They say natural daughter, for example, you know. If they want to be more about if if the parent had any kind of nobility, because remember, they only get a second name if they're if one of their parents them. is is noble, yeah, yeah, or at least a knight. or at least at least a knight, yeah. So, like for example, someone like Pate, you know, he's a bastard, but he doesn't get a name. Whatever the old town name would be, which I'm sure there's something, I just don't know what it would be. It actually, um, I'm trying to think, if there are any characters in Game of Thrones who are the bastard children of a noble woman and a common man. A noble woman and a common man. I yeah, think, I can't yes. think of any, but I could be wrong. I feel like there must be. But can you name one? Oof. Well, let's see. Who the mother was only. Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, obviously there are women who are the daughters. But I don't know if there's anyone else. That, that is, a, you may be right in that you may be right that there wasn't anyone else. I, I mean, I feel like I feel like I had read somewhere that someone had something like that, but I might be wrong. I might be mistaken. I can't think of any. I don't. Know, maybe the Blackfires. I don't know. The Blackfires. I'm not actually sure how the the first who who was how the, the Blackfires came about. Um. But the Targaryens would be a little bit of an exception in any case, because the, for the Targaryens, the female was, you know, would inherit, right? That was that was part of the some of these wars of succession, were because the Targaryens okay. believed in in right. female succession, and and like, you know, the rest of Westeros society doesn't believe in female succession. Yes, yes. Um, but I I don't actually remember how the Blackfriars get started. Who's, yeah, who's, it's complicated. Uh, it had to do with legitimacy. Magic, yeah, you know that some of the bastards were legitimized, and then when some of the other heirs died, there was a whole like, "Well, where are the real heirs?" So I right. think, I think there's at least one, but it's one of those sort of like unclear. No one that's that important. Let's just say that. Anyway, so let's move on to the actual content of the chapter because we are talking about we, this chapter because so they, like I said, there's this theme the names are important of course there's this theme you know of this contrast between people who make bold dramatic actions and people who make cautious reserved actions um in fact there was the, there's a little exchange between tyan who is one of the sand snakes and Dora martel where tyan says some men think because they are afraid to do 
and Duran responds, there's a difference between fear and caution. And that's really the theme of this entire chapter because, um, you know, the whole point of it is, is these three, three bastard daughters of Oberon, they want to get revenge. One of them wants to, you know, start a war. One of them just wants to go and assassinate some of the Lannisters. And one of them wants to declare Marcella um, the queen and basically like, you know, secede from the Seven Kingdoms. Um, and Doran, in the end, decides to um, round them up and basically like lock them up for their own protection. Um, All right. Just like, you know, and as an act of, um, one would say, overt loyalty to um, to the current king, to Joffrey, and to the Lannisters. Or because, to Tywin in, in particular. Or like to, to Tywin, yeah. You could say to you know to Tywin yeah, because to the king, he doesn't but it's believe to in these. He doesn't believe in in big dramatic bold actions. He believes in in caution and you know and planning ahead and you know you know he keeps his his cards close to the vest. So the question is, uh, does he have something else planned? And at this point, we really just don't know. We don't know. It's possible that he is just being cautious. You know, completely loyal to Tywin, so that he doesn't. Because he doesn't want war, maybe that's all but, it is. But if that's the case, it still shows that like he believes in caution um, rather than in like in bold action. Now, there's a few things that I think I want to bring up that you may have missed, and yeah. at least one you probably have. Yeah. One of them is the name thing. There is a point in which Ario thinks that about the parallels between him and Ares, Okart. He yeah. even thinks the names are similar. Right. Which is, and you have to think, there's no way that he put that in there, by which I mean George R. R. Martin. It didn't mean something. Especially because he's done that once before, when Theon is thinking about Osha and Asha. Yeah. And he thinks even their names are that. somewhat similar, and they're both women that are pains in my bum. You know, essentially was kind of how he was thinking yes. about it. Yes. <laughs> and I think there is something there, but it's hard to say what that is at this point. I mean, names well, are obviously relevant. I can I could give my theory, but that would be spoiling a little bit of what happens in the in the future of this book. All right, well, we could talk about that at the end because we're almost there anyway. But before I do that, I want to bring up something which is technically okay. a spoiler. Well, for book before three. before we get to the spoilers, um, I just want to talk a little bit about if there's any common themes across all four of these chapters. Right, okay. Okay, well, all right, let's do that. I mean, I okay. feel like there's definitely this so, aspect... Okay, hold on, let's, let's back up a little bit. First of all, um, some additional thoughts on the, the, you know, the Ario chapter about Dorne. Um, the Sand Snakes. Yes. I, one of my good friends who's a, is a Song of Ice and Fire reader thinks that the Sand Snakes are you know, not good characters, that they, they're, you know, they're too, like, outlandish and ridiculous and fantastical, and they, they detract from the quality of, um, you know, of the story. I don't necessarily agree, um, but I do think that they're, like, a little bit exaggerated in their qualities. You know, you have, like, the oldest one, Obara, who's, like, really warlike, and she's, like, this you know, she's the tough chick, right? Um, you know, the Marine, basically. Um, and then you have Nymeria, who's more of this, like, you know, they're almost like um, like Dungeons and Dragons characters, you know? Like, <laughs> Obara is like the warrior, and Nymeria is like the thief, you know? Um, you know, she's she, whatever. She's like this um, sort of dangerous, um, but like tricky sort of character who has like hidden knives on her person and stuff, and she'll like stab people and stuff. Right. And then you have Tyan, who's like uh, who's like an assassin character. Um, there's there are several hints to her having like poisons and. Well, she seems you know. like just an innocent. Right, and she has this this image of being like this pure, totally innocent. Um, you know, character which we know is like a facade, it's an act. Um, actually, one thing I did not like was the the hints 
that Duran and and the Maester both have that they're they're afraid that she might have hidden a poison needle in her hair so that like when Duran pats her on the head that he would like um, cut himself and poison himself. Um, I didn't like that because I kind of feel like having a poisoned needle in your hair is extremely impractical as a way of assassinating somebody um, because there's so much that could go wrong in doing that. Um, you know, just like trying to handle it yourself, let's say, if you're like, I'm going to put a needle in my hair, right? Like, how are you going to even put it in there without pricking yourself? Or without, if somebody touches it, they could cause it to prick you. Or how are you going to take it out afterwards? You know, it just it just seems very impractical to me. True, but uh, you have to assume that she's done it before at this point. Well, yeah, right. So whatever, but she's a master of But this her, is right? something that's like a, that's a very uh, okay. But no, yeah. I don't see now. I think you're reading the wrong message because I think the real message is that they're all they all sort of don't think about things. They all are too risky. No, absolutely. That's what I was saying before. Of course they are. That's 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 like the clear message is that they they don't think ahead. You know, they want to. They're dramatic. They're all living in the shadow of their father, um, Oberon Martell, who was like this really flashy guy, and everyone just you know adored him because he was badass, right? And so they all want to be as badass as he was. Right. Um, so yes, I think that is the point. Um, but so I think I think, I think they are, all bit, are trying you know, to I mean, be exaggerated. We can discuss like whether they're too outlandish, and and part of that is yes, they're trying to live up to the standard that was set by by Oberyn. Yeah, who is a great character. Yes, and I think part of it is he probably spoke to them about some of his plans about Marcella. Remember, Sotain is talking about this idea that if we just say that Marcella is the queen, the real queen then, you know, we'll basically, they'll come and try to, you know, attack us. And we won't really have to do right. anything other than defend ourselves. Right. You know, or something like that. And, of course, one of the things that's interesting is that in book three, although this is post-season three, but I will just say that there is a scene between Oberyn and Tyrion in which Oberyn says, do you think that Cersei would be, would find it, would be opposed if, Marcella was the real heir. And Tyrion at first is going to say, that's ridiculous. But then he thinks and thinks, you know, Cersei has always resented being what she thinks is being you know uh, hurt or harassed or prevented at becoming great because of her sex. So the idea that she yeah, sort of lived through her daughter was sort of, it's sort of like Tyrion has to say I don't know. And I think that at this point, it's it's an interesting it's, contrast. Actually, this is this is another interesting contrast between um, between Aaron and uh, you know and what's going on in Dorne. Where Aaron, we talked about him being sexist and basically going against Balon's wishes to have Aisha inherit um, by saying, "Oh, a woman could never leave the Ironborn." To now, all of a sudden, we're in Dorne, where Dorne is is you know basically you know egalitarian in the sense that women. Women inherit just as much as men do, and they're you know they have there could be a queen of Dorne. Yeah, they're definitely and, oligarchic. You know, women take precedence. They're oligarchic, but they are egalitarian. So, which is sort of like the opposite of the Iron People in a lot of ways. Yeah, in that you know so, the Iron uh, People are you know not egalitarian, but they're not oligarchic necessarily. Or at least that's where they're seeming to be pushed in. The king's mood is the, is moving away from the lord thing, because it seems like the Iron Islands have been with lords and so on for a while, and of course the right. king. But now they're moving away right. from that, right? Or at least that's the idea. Um, okay, yeah. so that's that was all I had to say about that chapter. I would like to talk a little bit about um, any sort of unifying themes among these four chapters, okay? And then we can get into some more spoilery stuff. All right, do that. So, so, so a few things that I noticed about these four chapters. Um, all of them are told from the perspective of either people who have no family or are separated from their family or, you know, Aaron is not really separated from his family, but he's kind of reserved for them because he's a priest. 
Um, and he sort of cut himself off from most of his family. Yeah, he doesn't really consider uh, himself a part of that. Remember, right. when like they start he does, calling He's not him, an option. He doesn't consider himself to be uh, to be an option for becoming a king. Right. He's like, no, I'm not, I'm not really related in that sense. I shouldn't be considered yeah. as an option. Right. So, like, none of, all of these people are sort of cut off from their families, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if it means anything, but, uh, but it is a unifying theme. Um, all of the stories focus on places and people that we've seen very little of, right? You've got North of the Wall, um, you know, you've got it's Old Town, Old Town, you've got Dorn, and you've got, you know, we've seen a little bit of the Iron Islands, but not a whole lot of the Iron Islands, and certainly we haven't seen much of Aaron. Right, we've really uh, only seen the Theon stuff. So this is all introducing, you know, new people and new places that we haven't seen. Um, and what's also interesting is that all of the point of view characters are people who don't really play a huge role in in the events that are going on, right? I mean, they're Baromir, not the ones Baromir are, just escapes well, from the battle and then he he dies. Well, you say right? that, except Aaron seems to be he he's trying to push things in a certain direction. Now, Aaron Aaron is pushing things, but even Aaron says like. I'm not going to even, you know, try to become the king. And he's not even going to decide. He definitely has a dog in the fight. He wants Victoria to win. Right. But he's basically putting it up to the masses. He's going to say whoever wins, wins. Right. So it's, so it's like, I mean, you could, you could argue that he actually is sort of like driving the plot um, to some extent. But, but he's still not, you know, he's clearly putting himself on the side of these of these major events. Yes, um, yes. So all of these chapters are sort of being given from the perspective of the characters who are like who are sort of on the side of all of the, the major events that are that are going on around us. And I thought that was an interesting choice, and I think that's going to change quickly once we start seeing um, you know some chapter perspectives from some of the more main characters, you might say. Right. Right. Um, so those are my main observations on on common themes i don't know if you had any any others that you noticed hmm. tie these different chapters together i do i think that well we're talking about like names in general and how mm -hmm. names are important right and there's definitely a connection and i think it also is relevant that these first two chapters aren't people's names but roles it doesn't say aaron it doesn't say Ario. right and part of that is that we've never heard of these characters. So it helps, I think, just from a perspective of let's let me you know, oh, let's put this another in part of it. And this is this is a very mild spoiler, spoiler but, you know, these char these characters don't have any more chapters or they might have like one or more chapter each in the rest of the book. But they basically hardly have any chapters. So I think that's part of why they have funny names for their chapter titles, because they're not regular point of view characters. That's They're true. like one shot or two shot point of view characters. Yeah, so it's interesting, I think, from that perspective. I think you're right about that, but it's also interesting that these were the point of view characters. We're seeing some things happening here. There's multiple things happening. So, first of all, what's happening with Veramir that matters? What is it? What is happening with the plot that pushes us off? I mean, we're learning things, that's true. But really, the only thing that's really being pushed forward is little bits. Nothing significant. The Old Town one, I think, there's more going on there. But it's also so, it's sort of like a subtle thing. More of, we don't really know what this means. Whereas, Aaron is very explicitly pushing things forward. And so is Doran as well. Although not Ario in particular, but, you know, in that chapter... Right. Doran is... You know, it's funny, you were talking about names and how similar Doran's name is to Dorn. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is intentional. I have to assume he was named for that. As the ruler of Dorn, you know, he is supposed to represent Dorn, right? In, in a sense, he is Dorn. And I think he definitely views himself that way, right? Like, I am Dorn. I have to do what's best for Dorn. Not what's best for me or my family or whatever, but like, I am acting on behalf of my my land, right? Yes. My my region, my kingdom. 
Um, and I think that that also is part of why he is so cautious as opposed to the contrast with the Sand Snakes who want to like go and start wars and stuff. I think you part know, of it is also that they're he, you know they're basically they're being much more selfish than he is. Also, right? he doesn't have any more you know, he doesn't have any siblings left. You know, Elia died during the sack of King's Landing, and his other siblings are also dead. Right. And of course the I think the other thing is of course we don't really know how things happened with him. But definitely something certainly you could make a an argument that something having to do with his gout, you know, his inability to walk, has something to do with how he deals with anything. He physically can't hurry anywhere. Right. And there seems to be sort of a parallel in that yeah. he not only physically doesn't, but doesn't mentally either. Yes. I think that's a good point. I think that's a good point. The gout gives him a lot of pain, and he has to learn to live with pain, right? And so he lives with physical pain, but he also lives with pain to his pride, right? The pride of Dorne and the Martell family, and, you know, wanting to take the revenge but not being able to do it. He learns to live with that pain and that humiliation, right? Um, and I think it's, it's also a good point what you said about him sort of, you know, he can't run, he can't even walk really, he can't move quickly, so mentally he doesn't move quickly either. Right? It doesn't mean that he's stupid, but like like we've been saying, he's cautious. So I think that, that actually the, the point about the gout is a good point. And I think that really does say a lot about his character. All right. So I think that's enough talking about um, you know, all these chapters. Um I think I think it's time to get into spoilers okay. for so, later in the books. So this is this is the official spoiler well, warning. Before I say that, let's just yeah. talk about what we're going to do next time. Okay. Because that's right. not really spoiler. Uh, this is not the official spoiler warning. Right. Sorry. So First, next... we're going to talk about what we'll talk about next time. So the next chapter is Cersei, and that's the next in A Feast for Crows. Then we have the next two in Dance of Dragons, which is Tyrion and Daenerys. Right. And after that, we head back to Feast for Brienne. Okay. So basically... We have sort of three in a row here from Feast for Crows, two in Dance, and then back to Feast again. And it sort of makes sense considering what we'll get to, obviously. It, it makes sense chronologically. And I think there'll be more going on that we'll see, too, when we get there. But I think that that'll be useful. All right, so the rest of our podcast will be spoilerific. <laughs> okay. So uh, what did you want to talk about in terms of you know, that you've been holding off on because of spoilers. Well, there's a couple of things. So you know, we start from the beginning, you know, with uh, Mr. Sixkins. Right. And there's the whole thing about how he somehow becomes inside the Weirwood. Yeah. And we were talking before about, you know, parallels to Bran. There's right. definitely right, right. a parallel there, for sure. There's something going on, but that's also, he can't stay there. That's something, that it doesn't work for him. But what's interesting is that it, I feel like there's actually something here that says this guy could have been, you know, the heir to the three eyed raven. He had the ability, he had the gift, but he chose to squander it. He, be, he chose to be to perform these abominations to become an, an abomination, and therefore it was he was rejected. He couldn't hold on to it. Do you, what do you think? Um. I think that's possible. I don't. I don't know that it's so simple. I mean, we don't you know, know of any other skin changer of, that's close to this level of ability. I mean, it's unlikely that Bran could have just, you know, put his spirit into a, a weirwood tree without the help of. You know, eventually he goes and he meets uh, the the three eyed crow. Um, True, but Dermot doesn't do it intentionally. He does it because he has nowhere else to go. I don't know. It's it's a it's a fair question if like that really means something, this abomination and that like you know, that really did impact him. Um my instinct is to say no that you know it's an abomination uh culturally, right? It's not like there's something wrong with it magically, but that um you know it's it's an immoral act. That's why it's an abomination. Well, I don't think the taking of humans is 
inherently an abomination. Otherwise, Bran wouldn't have been allowed to do anything. But it seems like there is something where he's just not ready for it. He can't do it. But, I mean, what we find out I don't out think later, he was... He wasn't even really trying to do it, though. Well, I think... Well, in that case, I think you could also just talk about how the art, you know, the different arcs here. About yeah. this is the kind of thing that Bran could have become. Um, yes, without without having the positive influence that he has, you know, he could I have mean, just it's all life. Into, like, yeah, he would have fallen into summer, probably. You know, at least at the beginning, is most likely what would have happened. Right. Although, I mean, I mean, Mar makes the point that most skin changers can only handle one animal at a time. It's very rare, you know. I mean, he has he's a rare, very rare talent to be able to to possess six. Six is a lot. He can't actually do all of them at once. No, he, but he's but he holds six of them, right? He's bonded to six at once. Yeah, but it seems like Bran w w is sort of on that track. Bran probably. I mean, we can't really know, but um, but it does seem like um, like like Bran had you know. The talents equal to Baromir potentially, you know. I mean, we don't know for sure, but it seems that way. Right, right. So there are other things, like for example, at one point Baromir kills a bunch of people. Who? I don't know that it matters. It's just random people. I mean, there's obviously stuff with the mole stuff and the people going to the sea, which are probably dead, from the stuff that we find out from Jon Snow later. Yeah, I I actually have a theory about that. Go on. My theory is that Mother Mole is bringing all of these people to this uh, this port, right? Yes. And um, somebody finds out, John finds out about it, or whoever, whatever. They try to bring a bunch of ships. They're bringing a bunch of ships to the port to rescue these people. So my theory is uh, it's going to be like a zombie movie. Um, you know, the whites are basically going to kill all of the people before they can get on the boats. And then the whites are going to take the boats and they're going to sail around the wall. And that's how the whites will get into um, Westeros proper. Uh, they're going to they're going to invade by ship instead of going through the wall. Uh, I have trouble with that one. What trouble do you have? It doesn't really seem like they really they can do anything. I mean, the leaders can probably do something. We know they have some intelligence. Because if you'll remember, um, the very first whites that the Night Watch discovers when they bring back to, uh, to Castle Black, the whites go and they attack Lord Commander Mormont specifically, not anybody else. They have enough intelligence to know who Mormont is that they should try to kill him instead of instead of trying to kill anyone. I'm not sure about that. Because he, he was just, it, I mean, well, maybe so. Maybe it's just that they recall some of their former memories. I don't know, maybe you're right. And like Sorry. you said, because, maybe, you know what? Um, and also, the White Walkers will come with them, and then maybe the White Walkers will sell the ships. Because the White well, Walkers seem to be sort of directing them. Yeah, right? also, remember, at the end of Veramir's chapter, he says, she sees me which would certainly seem to indicate a memory from before. It would, but I, I feel like it's just him being paranoid because she doesn't actually know that he's a ward, right? She doesn't actually know that he can, you know, he can, he can possess these wolves. So why would she look at a wolf and see him? Well, I, think, I think it's just him being paranoid. I don't think that she actually recognizes him. Maybe, I don't know. I think we know if this, what the spear wife knows. But it's interesting in that, like, this guy Hagon is sort of, you see, he's like some kind of mentor that we don't really know anything about, but he also tells us interesting things about other kinds of animals. And not only that, but the other thing, of course, I think the big thing is the true death. You know, the different types of death and how mm -hmm. John theoretically dies later on. Now, does he? Mm, I don't. Ah, you know, I didn't think about that. And this I didn't is... think about that, but it's possible that if John does die, which which it seems that's what happens to him, that he would have a second life, which would be him, you know, his spirit going into uh, ghost. 
Right. Now, you know, they Hagan also says that, you know, says, you know, once you do that, then you gradually like lose yourself and just yes. become an animal. True. So it wouldn't really it's not like John would still be alive in the body of a wolf. You know, he would he would retain some sort of memory of, of who he was, but that would gradually sort of fade over time. Hmm. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, we don't really know what would happen or what Melisandre has to do with any of that stuff either. Do you think all right, so do you have anything else from that? Um from the prologue, no. Okay. Well moving on to the next part. Yeah. Uh you probably don't remember, but there is stuff that happens later on where we see another page. No, I do remember that. That's that's in the um it's like an epilogue, right? It's the epilogue to Feast. Yeah. Yeah, so we do see this page like Sam meets him, right? Sam meets this guy, and the guy's like, oh, I'm Pate, like the pig's boy, right? Even though we know that Pate is dead because he died right, right here. Exactly. So the theories that I've seen presume that this guy, the alchemist, um, that he's a faceless man and that he is impersonating Pate. That is the theory. So why does he have the key? Who did he give the key to? Did he give the key to Marwyn? Well... Presumably, no, he didn't give the key to Marwen. Marwen has one. Well, that's what you All the think. Archmaesters have a key. Yeah, so that's why, who, why did he take the key? Just so, I mean, we don't really know. He took it, presumably, to get into somewhere in the Citadel. We don't know where, we don't know why, um, but he's up to something. True. So there is something there. It's, it's clear that there's something going on with the glass candles later on. And the other question is, if he is a faceless man, who's paying him? Yeah, is it Marwyn? Again, then if, it, if again, he is, Marwyn okay. doesn't need a key. He has one. So then why is it happening? Unless the key is something else. I don't know. Well, I don't know either. <laughs> For that matter, but yeah. So we don't really know. And I think it's kind of just interesting from that perspective. But anyway, so moving on. I I think that there isn't so much that I think needs to be said about the prophet one at this point. It's just sort of an it's a. It's no, a you were start. just thinking of um, um, Victorian, right? When um when you said he you think that Euron does something to somebody else. No, I forget he did. No, Euron slept with Victorian's. Euron Euron slept with Victorian's yeah. wife. I, I was just getting them. I was just getting yeah. them confused. But and then but that was explicit. And then though. did did Victorian beat her to death? Yes. I thought he did. Yeah. He sure did. Yeah, he beats her to death. It's kind of dark. It is dark, yes. Victorian's a, a very odd person. And he's like crying while he does it or something. Yeah, he's a weird, he's like, he's sort of like a parallel of Stannis in some ways, I think. Yeah, it's pretty dark. Speaking of sexism. Yes. There's a lot of sexism in, uh, in these Ironborn chapters. Oh, well, yeah. Well, he considers himself a girl like how he used to be. You know, he said the battles or women are in the, you know, the birthing chambers. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I feel like, I mean, obviously there's the thing about the maester, which is the other thing I wanted to say, which of course I couldn't because it was a spoiler, yeah. is that there's this whole thing that comes in the epilogue with Sam where Merwin is saying something about how magic has no place in the world that the maesters are trying to create. Yes. And there's something there. There is something, There's something there, like what you know, are the all maesters of a sudden, doing? All of a sudden, yeah, yeah. It, everyone's everyone, all the readers, any anyone who reads that, like all of a sudden they they have to ask, like the what? maesters are trying to build a world. Like the maesters are like they have an agenda. Well, then you think they they're trying to the eliminate dragons. magic. They killed the dragons, right? Exactly. Mm, yeah, and it does seem that there is a connection there. There is some kind of connection between dragons and magic. Yeah. So there's something there. What? We just don't know. It's just not in the books yet. But I did like that because in a way it kind of makes sense. And well, it was like that that is how you end a book with a cliffhanger, right? <laughs> yeah. That's how you do it. You have like a reveal of information that just changes how you look at everything that's happened in the past. 
and all of a sudden you have like a new perspective on everything, right? Although I did like the epilogue to Dance too. Um, the epilogue to Dance that was the one with with Kevin Lannister, yes, and Varys, yes. Okay, right. Yeah, I mean that was good too, and, and that was also a big reveal. That but the big reveal there was like Varys is back and yeah, he's okay. uh, he's making moves. Right, he's not just sitting in the background anymore. He's he's coming to the forefront. Not only that, but he's known all along about the Aegon thing. Yeah, I mean that's that in and of itself is not so surprising. No, but it's it's with sort of confirmation. Yeah. So, and it's also interesting in that, all despite everything that Kyburn and Cersei seem to think, Varys still had control over all his little birds. Remember? Well, they never really knew anything about his little birds. No, I mean, they just said, oh, people just start telling me stuff. The whispers. But all those were clearly just adults. You know, nobody, you know, Varys is the one who actually had this other access. So it's kind yeah, of although it's it's not really clear where he got this army of child spies. Well, he was a child at one point. So, he, <laughs> you know, it seems like it's something... You mean that, he was a child? <laughs> No, what well, nonsense thing, is this? He, when you remember, that was like his whole thing. Like he was kind of like, uh, he started out as a like a kid thug in a lot of ways, a kid thief, stealing information, learning how to read. Never told you about when someone cut my junk off. <laughs> and you know that that's a story he's been waiting. It's a so funny long story, to tell. really. He's, he just wanted to tell that story for so many years. And he, <laughs> like nobody, nobody wanted to listen to it, but finally Tyrion. It's like the he'd finally just tell it to somebody. And Tyrion was like, "Uh, um, well, first of all, he's he wouldn't tell Littlefinger. He'd lo- you know, obviously, because yeah. you, you don't want to give Littlefinger any information, basically at all. <laughs> you don't want to tell him anything. And who else is going to listen to him? <laughs> uh, I mean, you don't want to tell Pycelle anything for a similar reason, you know, because yeah. they might use it for something. But Tyrion." Tyrion's a different story, which is why that their relationship was interesting. So I, I like that one. But so let's move on to the the final one because you said right. you had some kind of theory here about Ario and Ares. Oh, now I have to remember what I was going to say. So Ario and Ares, they have similar names. Oh, I, I remember what my theory was. My theory is that they're actually very similar characters, and they're in similar positions in life, in their life, their roles, and. Ario basically is doing what he's supposed to do and what Eris is supposed to be doing also. You know, just acting as a as a bodyguard, staying out of out of the, the intrigue and the you know, the personal involvement, um, you know, just doing his job, not overstepping his bounds. Aris is a knight of the King's Guard, so he's also like a bodyguard, but he, you know, he allows himself to be seduced by Ariane and then, and then, you know, caught up in her plot, you know, and her plot. And, and it, it ties back into this chapter because this is sort of the, um, you know, the thing that drives her to, to start her plot. Because she, when she sees that Doran locks up the Sand Snakes, she's like, oh, well, Doran's not going to do anything. You know, he's just, he's being a coward. Um, you know, he's just going to kneel to Tywin Lannister, so I have to do this on my own, right? And that's basically her motivation to start this whole plot that she has of, you know, kidnapping Marcella and, you know, the whole thing that she's going to do, um, you know, and, and seducing Aris is all a part of that. Although, you know, I, it's possible that she actually is in love with him. It's not, it's not clear, or I don't remember really. I think she cares about him. She she cares about him. She's probably not in love with him the same way that he's in love with her. Um, but anyway, the point is, Eris, if Eris had had behaved in the same way that um, Ario does, you know, doing his job and and just staying out of the personal involvement, he would have been he would have been okay. He would have he would never have been caught up in this plot. Um, you know, he never would have ended up having to fight Ario as Ario foreshadows in this chapter, thinking about what would happen if they did have to fight each other. Um, so basically his, his lack of, um, you know, I don't know exactly what the word is. I was going to say integrity, but 
it's not it's not exactly integrity, but just like a lack of living up to his role and the way that Aria lives up to his role is his downfall. Yeah. But I think there's a definite parallel between their characters. All right. Well, we're almost at about two hours. <laughs> so, two hours. I know, right? We're, imagine if imagine if Benji was also involved. We're gonna have to be a little bit more. Um, All right. So yeah, let's next time let's be a little bit more streamlined. Yeah. I feel like we also get a little overwhelmed by let's talk about all the themes and meanings. <laughs> hey, themes are important. Yeah, Don't you okay. remember what uh, Benioff and Weiss said? Every episode has a distinct theme. Oh, is that what they said? That's the opposite of what they said. They said <laughs> they said themes are stupid and you shouldn't look for themes in episodes. And themes are never going to be there. Stop looking for them. Yes. But I mean, I just like Zack Snyder, I think uh, they were trolling people. Anyway, <laughs> let's wrap it up. And, you know, whenever we do the next one, all right. Probably, you know, maybe in a few days or so. It's another four chapters. Not so long. I think the Cersei one's pretty short. And the Tyrion one is not short, but it's not. I think uh, I think these are going to be relatively easy. These are all people oh, we are we'll just know. We'll just stick to, uh, you know, four chapters at a time for now. I agree. I think that'll work. Yeah. Okay. Nerd you later. Nerd you later. Nerd you later.